Hello, I'm Simon Whistler. You're watching Top 10's Net, and in the video today we're looking at the top 10 lies you're told about American slavery. There are large groups of historical revisionists that have a vested interest in trying to downplay it or reshape it in a way that's more comfortable for their agendas. There are also some people that have grown up with an overly simplistic version of slavery and its current state. We here at Top 10's, we strive to do our small part to push back against both of these. Number 10. Abolitionism was a popular northern movement. The idea that Union armies marched with the intention of freeing slaves is integral to the romanticization of the American Civil War and the idolizing of Abraham Lincoln. It gave a long, grueling war a sense of purpose that was meant to help everyone feel better about the end result. It's also not really what the situation actually was like in the North. The New York Times reports that as recently as 1860, an abolitionist movement called the Liberty Party ran a candidate that didn't win a majority in a single county. The largest abolition newspaper in the country only had a circulation of around 3,000 at a time when the combined population of the northern states was more than 20 million. Even among the black population that joined the Union Army, the vast majority were former slaves recently freed by the army they joined. When the Emancipation Proclamation was signed in 1862, it led to a spike in desertions among Union troops, some of whom were explicit about how emancipation was the motivating factor. In brief, it could hardly have been said that the average soldier would have been moved by a speech about freeing slaves. Number 9. The American Civil War was not about slavery. In order to defend fetishizing the Confederate flag, or rather the Army of Northern Virginia's battle flag and other aspects of Americans' Confederate heritage, the lie has been spread that the Civil War was fought over the rights of states, not the freeing of slaves. There are a number of aspects that can be cited to support this claim, such as the fact that Lincoln himself denied that the war was about slavery in the early days, since, as said, many people in the North were opposed to the idea of fighting a war to end slavery. However, the Southern states all included in their declarations of causes for their rebellion that it was either the superiority of white races or the issue of slavery. South Carolina, the first state to secede, charged the North with the crime of elevating to citizenship persons who, by their supreme law of the land, are incapable of becoming citizens. Mississippi's called slavery the greatest material interest in the world. However, much as people today might try to muddy the waters, back then the motivation for the rebellion was crystal clear. Number 8. Slaves Fought for the Confederacy when someone wants to claim that the American Civil War was about defending homes instead of slavery, more on this in a minute, they would be in line with the common revisionist rhetoric, which is to say that slaves and black people fought rank and file with their white associates. After all, who could deny the need for white people to defend their home state if even black people and slaves would set aside their differences for it? The problem is that for the longest time the Confederate government, they wouldn't have it. All black people, even those freeborn, were banned from serving as soldiers in the Confederate armies for almost the entire war. They served as camp followers that had to cook and clean as slaves, but they were not permitted to take up arms. When the Confederacy tried desperately to create black regiments in 1865, it was with the offer of freedom instead of to defend the South, and it happened so late in the war that they were never able to see combat. Number 7. Slaves were rarely killed by labor. The logic of this one is pretty straightforward and seemingly sound. Since a slave is likely going to be expensive, it's in the best interest of the owner to treat them well to make sure they can get more years of relatively less grudging work out of them. Noam Chomsky described how a prevailing argument among slave owners was that industrial wage workers had it worse than a slave because we take care of our slaves, you only rent them. However, it wasn't an approach that actually appealed to slave owners going by the available information. A slave owner in Louisiana named Bennett T. Barrow was unremarkable in describing almost daily beatings and torture for slaves. Food and housing standards were generally minimal, as much as a show of power as a means of cutting costs. A slave cemetery discovered in 1997 showed that many slaves died before the age of 12, and of those that survived into adulthood, many had lesions in their bones when their labors literally wore away the muscles to the bones. It seems that for most people rich enough to own slaves at all, there was enough income that even expensive human labor was disposable. Number 6. Freed slaves took control of southern governments after the American Civil War. 
For a century, this lie was used in the South for policies designed to take away voting rights from black people. The narrative essentially boils down to how, after slaves were freed, they immediately began voting for politicians that were so vile that they had to be forcibly removed from office for the good of all, exemplified by the fact that the majority of the newly elected leaders were black. The landmark film, The Birth of a Nation from 1915, is basically devoted to this falsehood. The truth was that during the high points of African American power, during the late 1860s, they only had a legislative majority in South Carolina. Other than that, it was much closer to Mississippi, where only 17% of elected legislators were black. What was actually happening was a wave of terror in the South, where black people and sympathizers were being murdered basically en masse, particularly black servicemen. In Louisiana alone, in 1868, more than a thousand people were murdered for this reason. In short, the truth was much closer to the terrorism we mostly associate with the Middle East today being inflicted upon freed slaves. Number 5. Slaves were only owned by the wealthiest as evidence that the average Southern soldier didn't fight in the Civil War to defend the institution of slavery, it's put forth that the vast majority of them couldn't begin to afford a slave. The average price of a slave in 1860 was $800, which certainly sounds above the pay grade of a soldier making $11 a month, as the average Confederate private was when they first enlisted, so it sounds even more reasonable. However, you have to consider that among the people that fought for the Southern armies, such as the Army of Northern Virginia, slave ownership was much more common than you think. One in ten soldiers owned slaves. Another 25% of the soldiers, who did tend to only be around the age of 26 and naturally wouldn't have saved up to buy their own, lived in slave-owning households. In the officer class, half were slave owners. That's not factoring in how many aspired to be slave owners, worked on plantations as overseers or related jobs, or the number who felt that keeping black people in chains was the proper order of things. If there were soldiers that fought only for states' rights, they were certainly not the overwhelming majority. Number 4. Even if the South won the Civil War, slavery would have ended shortly after. As part of the argument that the Civil War wasn't about slavery, some claim it was dying out on its own. For one thing, the fact that every major trading partner for the Confederacy had outlawed slavery is offered as a sign international pressure would have led to it being banned. Also, advances in technology would have allegedly made slavery obsolete. In fact, though, slavery was so profitable at the time that an average slave owner could expect a 100% return on their investment within 10 years, and considering the light costs, that meant each slave was almost pure profit for decades if they lived to even middle age for the time. Further, there's the fact that nearly a century later, Nazi Germany put millions of people into highly profitable slave labor. Even today, some countries still find a use for it. So, if the southern states had indeed become a separate nation, it would have meant a long time when millions of people lived and died as property. Number 3. The first slaves in America were white people An argument used to downplay the atrocities of the slavery of black people in America is the claim that Irish immigrants were an overlooked group that also got enslaved. Irish people certainly were put into forced labor under the more sophisticated sounding label, indentured servitude, and well, doesn't that just show how phony and shallow the feelings of people opposed to slavery of black people are? Well, there were significant, immediate, tangible differences between indentured servants and slaves. Indentured servants still retained basic human rights, such as the fact neither they nor their children were designated property. It was contractually possible to get out of indentured servitude through labor, something no slave could help to get through anything more than their master's whim. Number 2. Slavery was a Southern problem For the average American, the first instinct when the issue of slavery in America is brought up is to imagine a slave being worked to death on a plantation, while the enlightened northern states were their only hope of freedom. It helps natives from those states feel their hands are much cleaner of the peculiar institution and allows unambiguous condemnation of the South as well just a bunch of racists. In truth, many northern states didn't merely tolerate southern slaveholding for a long time, there were also many active participants. Almost all the ships that brought slaves through the infamous Triangle trade originally set sail in New England, even well after it was banned in that region. Northern states also allowed slavery much later than history textbooks usually admit. In Pennsylvania, for example, there were still hundreds of black slaves in 1850, even though it had been banned under state law in 1780, because the Gradual Abolition of Slavery Act allowed them to remain slaves until their 28th birthday. So the taint of slavery is much more prominent on northern states than a passing knowledge of history might indicate. 
Number 1. Slavery is illegal in America as a means to try and put the openly slave-friendly time behind them, revisionists that want to downplay slavery will mention that it became illegal more than 150 years ago, so why continue to claim that it's still important? Indeed, Steven Spielberg's biopic Lincoln treats the passing of the 13th Amendment to outlaw slavery as an unambiguous triumph. Unfortunately, as made clear in Ava DuVernay's documentary 13th, the 13th Amendment contains a loophole that allows people to be put into forced labor as a form of punishment for being convicted of a crime. While chattel slavery was outlawed by Franklin Roosevelt in the 1940s to prevent it being used for Japanese propaganda in World War II, the amendment, well, it's still in place. Duvernay's documentary also points out that 25% of all people that are incarcerated in the world are in the United States and thus vulnerable to being pressed into slavery. Indeed, in January of 2017, Sheriff Thomas Hodgson in Massachusetts offered local inmates as slave labor to help build the border wall with Mexico. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below and don't forget to subscribe for brand new videos just like this every day of the week. Also over there on the right, a couple of other videos that you might enjoy if you enjoyed this one and thank you for watching.